nothing friendlier than an audience full of folks who are trying to support the lives of, of children and childhood development. Happy birthday, Children's Museum. You're looking damn good for 100 years old. I should look so good at 100 years. Um, I want to talk to you today about how executive functioning science, new behavioral economics, um, new knowledge about social networking theory, new decision-making theory, um, how this, this um, cross-sectoral science can be brought to bear in designing programs that really can begin to address some of the dispiriting kind of information that we've been hearing this morning. So I'm here to be kind of, I guess, uh, a little bit of uh, the uh, hope flying out of Pandora's box and um, talk with you a little bit about the work of CWU and what we're finding using this science to try to improve the lives of low-income families. So CWU, Crittenden Women's Union, is an organization based in Boston that is a very odd bird. We are an action tank, which I guess for this audience the easiest thing would be able to explain. We are to anti-poverty organizations what a teaching hospital is to a community hospital. We definitely deliver services and deliver care, uh, but we're all the time trying to research and learn and use applied research for the care that we're delivering to, to devise new ways of helping low-income families get out of poverty. And then we're taking that knowledge public um, in order to make macro change, in order to develop tools that can help train other agencies and inform the field, and also to create uh, public policies that are more supportive to families' economic trajectories. So our work really is to help low-income families get out of poverty. We deliver the sort of legacy, war on poverty kind of services that help as a safety net to low-income families. But what we're really focused on is the R&D that will create new pathways out of poverty to the family-sustaining jobs of today. So the crux are, or the basis, the programmatic basis of our work is we have devised some new programmatic approaches that I'm really going to be focusing most of my uh, speaking about today um, called mobility mentoring. But in addition to that, we are the largest provider of transitional housing for homeless families in greater Boston. Um, we provide housing for victims of domestic violence, job readiness training, and parenting and healthy families. Um, I think we are the largest provider of healthy families in greater Boston as well. We serve in Greater Boston 1,400 individuals a year, 400 homeless families at any one time, 140 or so of them in transitional housing and the balance that are in stabilization moved into permanent housing that we're trying to help them stabilize in. Um, you can see from these statistics that the families that we are serving are dead center in the sweet spot of the issue that we're talking about today, which is how to help these high-risk families. 78% of them have a high school education or less. In fact, about half of them have less than a high school education. Um, you can see their average earnings are $592 a month. 96% of these families are headed by single parents. And you can see from the racial and ethnic breakdown that these are also families that are at high risk, and we'll talk more about this as well. So um, I'm going to jump right in from that to talk with you about um, how, in particular, executive functioning science, but other scientific frames that I've mentioned earlier, um, actually have informed the way that we do our work. So Jack talked a lot about the basics of this executive functioning science. I want to talk with you a little bit about how it plays out in terms of the skill sets that adults need and, ha and have. First of all, my neuroscientist friends um, uh, uh, who are training me by the day um, talk about two executive functioning frames. They're critical frames for this kind of metacognition that is so required to get out of poverty today. First is this framework that we talk about, which is the now versus the future frame. Our ability to be able to understand the implications of decisions made now and their impacts on the future, our ability to weigh desires, current desires, and impulses against future gains or losses, the second frame they talk about is um, the self versus others frame, or the interpersonal frame. 
our ability to be able to reflect on ourselves and our own um, emotions, our thinking, our reasoning, the ability to step back and sort of reflect and to think about who we are as people and why we are reacting in certain ways, but in particular, our ability to understand that others do that differently than we do, you know, to be able to mature to the place where we can uh, anticipate how others might react to us, anticipate what they may be thinking or feeling at any given point in time, anticipate their um, motivations separate from us. The other um, uh, frames that we use are three key skill sets that are executive functioning skill sets that Jack alluded to earlier. And the categories of these skill sets are inhibition, working memory, and set shifting. Um, inhibition is our ability, once again, to be able to think about uh, uh, the, what has occurred and reflect on our emotions, step back, pause, and actually react differently than our gut instincts would tell us immediately to do. So it's the ability to, to have the separation of cognition for the thing that our emotions are driving and to reflect, reflect on that and perhaps react differently. It is um, working memory is our ability to keep things in our head, multiple things in our head at the same time. So it is our ability to be able to multi-process, to be able to have a lot of things, competing things that we're thinking about, and to therefore be able to prioritize those things and to make choices in how we spend resources. And my families that I serve are very, very low in both time and money. Their time is, there are huge demands on their time, and they're also, um, they have very, very little money. And so how they invest their time and money has to be done in very, very careful careful and planful ways. The last thing I want to talk about is shifting or set shifting. This is the skill set that people oftentimes have a hard time really understanding. But um, set shifting is, um, I'll just give you an example. It is what you use when you are um, basically reflecting on your uh, decisions and applying different rules. So set shifting is doing math word problems. Remember that? When you would learn how to do a particular scientific pro uh, mathematic process and you would have that A plus B equals A plus A squared plus B squared equals C squared and you would have that all down and you would have done a whole bunch of, of different kinds of math problems by rote, practicing those skills and solving. And then all of a sudden the teacher throws something at you that's a picture of a shadow cast by a tall building and saying, how tall is the building when the shadow is this long and you're going, huh? It's, it's the ability to be able to take a set of rules that you've learned in one context and apply it to something different. It is the ability to have multiple sets of rules going on in your head at the same time. So, so for you uh, who are musicians in the audience, think about how when you're playing in the key of B flat, the music, the music that you're reading along, all of a sudden you know that you have to take a note and suddenly play it a half step lower than you would normally have played it if it were in the key of C, and you have to do it on the fly, and then those keys shift, and the time signatures shift, and you have to be able to shift every step of the way with it. Well, that's what set shifting is. And these skills are critical skills. They're metacognition skills that actually are skills that we have to have as adults to just be able to survive and thrive in the adult world. They also happen to be skills that we have to have in abundance to be good parents. So how does this play out with the families that I serve? How do we see this executive functioning dampening playing out in these families? Well, first of all, as, as I told you, we house at any one time 100 families, 140 families in shelter, some of them in close quarters with each other. We have 58 families that we're housing in one location at any one time. And what we will see is we will see families that are passing each other in the hallway to go to the bathroom or to get a meal or something like that who bump into each other and immediately assume that the person who bumped into them is dissing them. You know, you're dissing me. Why are you looking at me like that? Why are you talking to me that way? Where there's a constant threat around every corner and hyper-reaction to all of that. Um, with them, their friends, their neighbors, their staff, their children. It is, that, it is that sort of hypersensitivity to environmental cues and what we often think of as inappropriately escalated responses to those cues. Um, we see families that have um, problems with uh, social skills. 
where they don't really have the capacity in many cases to think about the implications of their social behaviors on how other people are going to feel and behave. So these are the things like people who bring, speak on cell phones in the middle of meetings, um, who basically uh, uh, get up and leave and walk through each other's um, spaces, who interrupt, who um, have all kinds of behaviors when they're, when they're tr trying to um, engage in the workplace that we would consider as inappropriate workplace behaviors and lacking in sort of uh, what we would think of as mature framing for that kind of social interaction. Um, we have problems with families with their future orientation of decision making. So we have families who very much respond to what we call the crisis du jour. Our families have a tendency to make decisions with what is screaming in their face at the moment. And so because of that, um, they will have situations where, uh, you know, they will be in the process of filling out search papers to get permanent housing. They will get a phone call, and that phone call will be from a friend who says that her car has just broken down and she needs somebody to pick her up, and they will go and, and try to help that friend, um, you know, get transportation or get that friend's child, taking themselves completely off of track of what they were doing in working on their permanent housing or their longer term kind of, of things. And this will shift over and over and over again in the course of a day. So that there's this immediate reaction to whatever is, is there in, in their face at the moment, screaming at the moment, and that's what has a tendency to get the most attention. And last but not least, um, one of the things I want to talk with you quite a bit about is um, we see problems in contextualization of decision making. And by that I mean the ability to be able to think that about the choices one has in how one spends their time or their money. Oftentimes, our families do not feel like they have any choices at all. Their behaviors are very, very reactive, and they have a tendency to, um, to basically, uh, as I said, respond to the stimulus of the moment instead of having the capacity to sort of think about how the reaction to that particular problem at that moment will impact not only their future, but also their ability to tackle and resolve other problems and set priorities. So how do we work with this? Well, the first thing we do is um, we have a program that we've developed called Mobility Mentoring that's a framework of approach that we're now using within our own programs that we've trained other organizations on. This Mobility Mentoring framework came out of some of the science that, I, that we're talking about today. And in fact, um, we started developing this platform in 2006. We didn't deploy it until 2009, but it's been getting really pretty amazing results. So I want to talk with you about that data and those outcomes today, because we do have some outcomes. Um, the mobility mentoring platform was built to ameliorate some of the problems of executive function and that we know that our, our parents, our families have. Um, and the first component is a scaffolding approach that I will show you. The second is we use clear goal setting and outcomes measurement frameworks to reinforce keeping families on track with priorities. Um, we use tangible rewards to decrease the horizon of reward for long-term um, tasks. So for our families to actually create gratification early on for things that may normally have given gratification much later in the process of the task. We uh, do executive functioning, skill building, and coaching the longer we work with families. And last but not least, we work with peer support and building peer support and social leveraging networks so that families can enhance their own executive functioning interpersonal skills, um, but also so that they can gain uh, the kind of social supports and leveraging social supports that so much Dr. Xavier Briggs and others' work tells us is so crucial to economic mobility. So um, let me start with the scaffolding. The bridge to self-sufficiency is our theory of change, and it starts out as a scaffold that is designed to, on paper, approximate wise, now future decision-making and contextualized decision-making of multiple competing priorities that all have to work together. Basically, 
Um, what we believe at CWU is that for a family to become economically independent, and by that I mean, you know, we just released the Mass Economic Independence Index last week. You may have heard um, from Massachusetts, we're talking about for a mother and a one preschool and one school age child, approximately $65,000 a year is what it takes to live independently without um, safety net subsidies to meet the basic requirements of life in Massachusetts. So um, what we're talking about here is uh, that families have to have five cylinders firing to have a chance of hitting jobs that pay that kind of money. Um, the five cylinders are family stability, well-being, education, financial management, and employment and career management. And basically at the top of the pillars to the bridge, you can see the relative standard that a family needs to be at in order to stand a chance of actually getting to that economic self-sufficiency point. And what you will see is that each one of these pillars have um, varying levels of risk, the bottom of the scale showing where so many of our families are when they enter the services that we provide. The idea is to get all these cylinders firing together. If there is a hole or a break in one of these pillars of the bridge, meaning if you, are, if you have education, if you have low debts, if you have child stability, but you still have significant depression or your education has not been in a career-related field that will help you, um, that these kind of deficits will prevent you from being able to get all the way to economic independence. Now, what's interesting about this scaffold and why it is a scaffold is because um, it basically allows for two things to happen at the same time. Remember those skill sets and frames I was telling you about? First of all, you'll notice that it allows for us to assess where a family is at any given point, an individual is at any given point. But it also allows that to be shown in the context of where they need to be in the future in order for them to attain economic independence. So it actually puts on paper the now future context of each of these areas. It also allows for contextualization of the various pillars. In other words, it allows you to see how your child's depression or your child's health care problems um, have interrupted you repeatedly in your ability to be able to stay in school or work. And so the interrelationship between those two things becomes apparent. It also shows, um, again, the interrelationships between all of these areas and allows for parents to see um, at any one time how these things begin to fit together and how they create uh, something where simultaneity of process is required. Now, this is a very special thing because I'm used to, our families are used to, I get this phrase all the time, my staff do, don't talk to me about more than one thing. Talk, tell me one thing I have to do next. Don't tell me more than one thing. Um, I can only think about one thing right now. Well, this is a classic problem of using um, you know, working memory and the ability to do set shifting to be able to figure out how to solve your problems and tackle the issues of your day. When you're under a lot of stress, when you don't have a lot of time, when you don't have a lot of resources, um, you have to make your choices even more wisely than the well-resourced individual. And we're trying to help people get to the point that even though their mind does not want to think about more than that one thing, by getting it down on paper, what we get is what the psychologist psychologists or psych psychoanalysts would call abreaction. Abreaction. The mothers and families plot themselves on this grid and we screen for and do special screening tools in each of these areas and we get families saying, oh my God, now I see why it is. I'm stuck. I've been having this problem. That's not working. I'm homeless. This has been going on. I see how these things relate to each other. We also have families tell us, interestingly enough, that when we start talking in this way, that this is the first time, and this is a direct quote, we've had it more than once, this is the first time they've ever had a grown-up discussion. They refer to this as grown-up conversations. Isn't that funny? Because mature executive functioning is the hallmark of being a mature adult. So how do we do this? How do we do this work? Well, this is Julia. Julia it lives in shelter. She's a 25-year-old mom with a 3-year-old child. You can see that she's currently homeless. Her child has significant behavioral problems and asthma. The child is in center-based, in shelter-based daycare intermittently. And the child's behavior and issues with the child's daycare and lack thereof frequently interrupt the mom's day and make her stop what she's doing. She doesn't have child care beyond what's in the shelter. Her networks are not offering much in the way of support. She lives too far from home and her neighborhood, and she doesn't get along with her mother. 
She has a GED, but no other education. She has no savings, but she's currently rather she's currently up to date on her credit card payments, but her credit is poor. She is unemployed. What happens when she plots herself and she gets this aha? Well, the work that we're doing with these families in shelter and in other locations is all voluntary. And what happens is we begin to see where we are and the Gordian knot of poverty, the interrelationships of all these things begin to become more apparent. And what happens is you can start setting goals designed to begin to ameliorate the problems and um, get movement on the levers that are easiest to start moving and most important to start moving first. So in the case of Julia, she's living in shelter for about 12 months. And our goal and her goal for herself while she's in shelter is to move into a subsidized apartment for her to get access to um, early, an early intervention program and get her child screened for primary care and asthma to start socializing with other parents and begin to be part of a parenting group, to maybe start examining options for going to school after she's moved into her apartment, to start a modest savings account with $2 a week, to start paying a little more than minimums on her credit card bills, and to get a small part-time job. She's on her way. So how is this done um, in a clear goal-setting framework and an outcomes measurement framework? Well, if individuals are going to attain goals, families and programs have to have clear expectations for the goals. I'm showing you here three levels of programming in which we apply mobility mentoring. The bottom level you can see is in Hastings House, a family shelter. The second level program is Abbott House. That's a multi-year supported housing program for very, very young mothers um, who are normally there about three years. And the top is our premier program called the Career Family Opportunity Program, which is a five-year program working with fully subsidized low-income families in public housing that is designed to get them to a $45,000 to $50,000 a year job with $10,000 saved in the bank in five years. Um, We're deploying mobility mentoring in all these contexts, and as you can see, the goals, expectations for the program itself, as well as interim goals that are being set, are very different given the populations that are in each location and also the, um, the length of time and the resources that are available. All of these programs are basically also deploying tangible rewards, which, as I said, is used for families who have a hard time seeing distant into the future, so that every step, that application for a community college or that applying to get your transcripts from a prior school can actually lead you to have the college degree that you need to be able to support your family. Seeing from now that far out is very hard for our families, so we're trying to bring the rewards frame closer. We do this by cash incentives, savings matches, gift cards, We do it also by a lot of recognition and opportunities for recognition of a variety of different types. We do it by the bridge itself. The movement on the bridge itself for families is a very tangible thing. Um, They actually post the bridge in their homes, some of them. Um, We have departmental bragging boards that we have all over our organization that show department by department how much they've moved these families ahead in a given year. Last but not least, they have, of course, the personal achievements themselves that happen, the diplomas, the savings, the home ownership that starts to happen. As we work with families longer, that scaffolding goes from being something that's on paper that allows them to keep on paper something that they really can't and don't want to keep in their heads, which is all of these issues in their their lives and how they're interrelated. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take this scaffold and begin to translate this ability to think about the future, this ability to contextualize decision-making, this ability to pause and reflect the metacognition. We're trying to translate into behavior change that becomes internalized and that they transmit to others. So we're trying to coach them to have the behavior changes that really do change the world they're living in. So these behavior changes are, of course, impulse control. Uh, Don't hit the send button. Uh, We have families who are working in groups with each other who have a tendency to get irritated and send flamers out. And, of course, what we're trying to do is we're trying to help families understand the implications of don't hit the send button (laughs) Um, and trying to get families to pause and reflect. Now, what's really interesting is the child partners that we're working with now in Washington State and Alicia Lieberman in San Francisco are actually using very common, a very common kind of platform and language. They're telling parents, stop 
Think about what do you think your child is thinking? What were you thinking at the time? Why did you do what you did? Why do you think your child did what they did? How do you think it could be best to resolve your needs, your child's needs? How do we begin to mediate these things? That very same language that child parenting, psychotherapy, and, and other early interventions with executive functioning frames use, we are using in the adult framework in the exact same way. Did you think about the implications of that decision? Stop before you yell at the person who bumped into you in the hallway. Did you think about why it is maybe they did what they did, you did what you did? Think about why your employer said those. The frameworks and the coaching frameworks then reinforce each other. We're helping families discover that everyone, whether they see it or they don't see it, has choices and options are available to them, and help them to see how different choices in time and money investments change the outcomes in a very, very significant way. We're trying to coach resilience, the ability to recalibrate, the ability to take a plan, and when the plan breaks, which they always do, or is affected by the life happens bumper sticker, to actually get the families to understand that, once again, you can rebuild, you can recalibrate, you can get yourself on task with the larger goals. And, of course, we're trying to promote pro-social behavior. How do you think it makes others feel? We're also using a lot of science around social networking theory to basically promote executive functioning interpersonal skills with use of peer groups, development of peer groups, both community groups of larger numbers of families and also peer affinity groups of small numbers of families trying to achieve the same personal goals. And we're also connecting our families, as you can see here, to broader professional networks so that they can create leveraging networks that will help, help them move ahead in the broader society. So what's the outcome? Well, here's some data. We've been working with these families um, since 2009, as I said. And last year, you can see some of the outcomes of our families. Um, these are families, these, these um, short-term programs are shelter families. So these are families who are either in short-term job training programs, 12-week programs, or are in shelter for homeless families, or are in stabilization, or are in um, GED programs. What I can tell you is if you don't know what the outcomes are typical for these families, what you are seeing here in front of you are outcomes that are typically three, four, and five times higher than expected. So um, for, 100, for the families who were in school and or working within six months post-completion of GED, job readiness, or supported housing programs, the anticipated expected working in school would be under 20% in most contexts. For the CFO program, which, as I said, is our five-year program, we now have 45 families enrolled in this particular program that's designed to help low-income families um, move from being fully subsidy-dependent to being economically independent. So here we go. This program started in 2009, and it's expanding. We've been training other agencies how to do this kind of work. And so um, the families who started with us in the beginning those families have now, um, well, I'll just talk about overall and make it faster. You can see that with families that started with an average of a little better than high school, now over 83% of them as of January already had, a, um, had a, a, an associate's degree or higher. 21% of them had a bachelor's degree or higher. This was with a starting point, as I said, of 12.8 years. So in two and a half, three years, we've gotten families to the point that they have an associate's degree or higher. Now let me give you the stats on these families. Head of household, 37 years old. Initial income, $11,600 a year. Two, over two children per family. These are uh, one-third, one-third, one-third African-American, uh, Caucasian, and Latina families. These are families that had been on subsidies a long time and had been in poverty a long time, very trapped families. And we now have these families at um, 80, 83% and higher. This year it'll be higher at the end of the school year um, with educational degrees and on their way. Now this is an astounding figure because currently in Boston, our greater Boston Community College six-year college completion rates are under 10%. Under 10% of, of individuals who go to community colleges in Boston actually obtain an associate's degree within six years. African-American persistence rates, meaning they progress from one year in college to an, the next, African-American persistence rates in our community colleges in greater Boston right now are 1.2%. 
So what I'm showing you here are statistics on persistence that are definitely very, very drastically beyond expectations. 21% of our families already had, as of January, a job with $45,000 to $50,000 a year. 96% of them were working or going to school 32 hours a week. 44% were working and going to school more than 32 hours a week. They've bought their own homes, three of them. This is, again, out of an N of 45 families, um, where most of the families have been in the program two years or less. Only 12 of them have been in over three years. One is pre-qualified, and five are in home buying processes. Last year, these 45 families achieved 66 major child-related outcomes, meaning completion of uh, special summer camps, completion of family therapy programs, completion of IEP and core evaluation and new school selection, um, just a whole variety of, of outcomes. And last but not least, these families, as of January, had saved almost $60,000 of their own money. What I can tell you that we've learned from all of this is that um, outcomes measurement is required, is crucial to be able to attain these kind of outcomes, both for the organization and for the families. The frames must be clear and scaffolded in a clear way. Meaningful change requires co-investment. People do not get out of poverty in three months. They are not coached to have behavior change in three months. Co-investment is what's required. The harder the family works at it, the more you have to give to them. Working in silos works against families who are low income. The silo-based service delivery system that we have right now is very much antithetical to the skill sets that our families have and need to develop, um, are missing and need to develop. Um, this is a structural problem that really fights against economic mobility with our family. And last but not least, improving executive functioning skill sets creates gains in family stability, well-being, education and finances, career and management, all of those outcomes improve. So thank you very much.